This is Marco Reus. This is Shinji Kagawa. This is Nuri Shahin. Hello, this is Jaden Sancho. And you're listening to the Yellow Wall Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 328 of the Yellow Wall Pod. I am your host Stefan Butzko and today we will talk about Borussia Dortmund's 1-0 win over Hertha BSC and we will preview Saturday's afternoon match against Düsseldorf and for all that and more join me Matthias Zuck. Hello Matthias, how are you doing? Hello Stefan, I'm doing well on this sunny day in Colorado, how are you? Well, uh, nice for you to point that out because it's uh, pouring down and there's thunder in Philadelphia. So uh, if people hear that in the background, uh, I apologize, but there's nothing I can do about it. And I hope we don't get a blackout because that uh, would mean we would have to do everything again, which we do not have time for. Um, so without any further ado, I'm also glad to introduce Lars Polman. Hello, Lars. How are you? How's the weather in Bonn? Hello, Stefan. We have gray skies, so I guess it's the in-between between you two guys. I guess so. Well, uh, gray skies also at the Yellow Wall Pod because we do not have a sponsor for this episode. But uh, I'm sure next week we will. Uh, if you want to be one of these uh, people supporting us, please sponsor an episode and go to patreon.com slash the yellow wall for more information. And now, without any further ado, uh, it's time to talk about the barn burner that was the 1-0 win against Hertha Berlin. Um, but uh, personally, I'll add that I was very happy with the three points and uh, the way they came about. Um, Matthias, your thoughts? Well, German, I think we would say that was C. Um, so, but it was exactly what we kind of expected it to be. You know, Hertha played relatively compact, uh, physical. I'm surprised they didn't try to attack a little bit more. Uh, I'm Aside from the one shot from Alexander Eswein, uh, I'm struggling a little to think of many big opportunities for Hertha. So Dortmund had a few other opportunities that they should have scored from. I think a 1-0 probably about overall the correct result uh, and the right winner. Dortmund deserved it. I don't think Hertha deserved a win or even a point, given that I didn't really ever feel overly threatened by them. Yeah, that would be correct. Um, Lars, uh, Mats Hummels was uh, obviously suspended for this game due to picking up his fifth booking. Um, Emre Can replaced him and uh, obviously ended up being the very valuable goal scorer. But uh, what did you make of his performance at centre-back? Well, I would honestly not single out Emre John. Uh, I would say that all five center backs on the pitch, and that includes obviously the two of Hertha, uh, Boyata and Torona Riga, uh, in addition to Akanji John and Lukas Piszczek, I think they, they all pretty much had a, or, or gave us a, a center back clinic because I think that was the kind of game it was, uh, a game where center backs could make the difference because the, Perhaps the the creative department in in both sides wasn't up to the the absolute highest standards that they've set previously. I mean, even Hertha under Bruno Labbadia have done much more going forward than they did, did against Dortmund. Obviously, they were without their talismanic striker in Matthias Kunja, so maybe that played a part in it. But all five centre halves, I think, had a very strong game they they all had presence in the air um they they didn't get fooled by any one attacking move i mean there were a couple of chances as matthias said that dortmund arguably could have scored from but i don't think there was necessarily a mistake involved in any of those uh especially the dortmund center backs and i would say boyata as well were also really good in passing uh, i think we, you saw kind of what John adds as an element, as a learned defensive midfielder playing center half in, in that he's thinking on his front foot, much like Mat Mats Hummels is obviously, but you know, he has a different uh, body type 
and more willingness, I guess, to advance and, and a bit more speed, obviously. So I think that was a, a nice element, especially in the kind of game where uh, Dortmund perhaps lacked a bit of the usual creativity from other uh, outlets. So all in all, I think uh, he did very well, but so did all of the other center backs on the pitch. So uh, maybe not, as you said, a barn burner necessarily, but still a game where if you're looking for it, there were still some uh, pretty impressive performances, I would say. No, without a doubt. I actually think uh, that you really have to credit Dortmund for the defensive performance they gave um, in for goal. Um, the app that, that gives some expected goals, that has uh, Hertha on 0.12 expected goals. I think Stats Bomb has Hertha at 0.4. Um, either way, uh, I don't really recall too much danger and uh, I don't also recall any mistakes. Um, Matthias, I, right after the game, framed it in a, in a way that you actually need to uh, give Lucien Favre a lot of credit for uh, Dortmund playing the way they played. Um, obviously, there is uh, ongoing uh, debate, speculation about his future Dortmund, but I feel um, if Dortmund can... Um, on a day where the attack is maybe uh, firing on all cylinders with Arling Haaland injured and, and whatnot, uh, that you can really rely on the backline by now, uh, even even being that Hertha weren't uh, the threat that they could be. But uh, I thought that overall um, the balance that Dortmund have right now and what they have achieved uh, is, is something you can uh, behold. Without a doubt. I mean, it was thoroughly deserved it was thoroughly professional um there's a lot of flexibility now in the side uh i think um one of the nice things out of well if you're gonna pick a nice thing <laughs> out of this whole you know covid crisis and the way the bundesliga and football is reacting with the the five substitutes is also seeing more of Pelardi and moray um that's a huge benefit for young players so i kind of wouldn't mind the five subs just staying as a rule in football uh, to, to help that and to alleviate some of the uh, physical stress on the players. But I think, yeah, you, you definitely have to give Favre credit for um, rallying the troops, so to speak, after the disappointing loss against Bayern, where I think a point probably would have been the more just outcome. But Overall, I don't I don't have any complaints right now. Um, Dortmund are playing well. They're playing professional. And so far in the matches since the restart, aside from Bayern, haven't really been threatened to drop points, to be honest. I mean, Dortmund only dropped six points in the Rückrunde. Uh, I think two losses against Bayern and against Leverkusen. And, uh, you know, the one against Leverkusen was a bit vexing because they obviously threw a lead away in that particular game, but you never know against the wild card. That is Peter Bosch. Anything could happen, but um, I think um, if we think back to the uh, the the first game this season against Setup BC and where it was Favre's job very much on the line, I feel like right now he's very firm into the driver's seat. Um, Lars, if you want to sort of uh, draw a resume, as we would say, well, fazit scene, as we say in German, um, uh, how how do you see the development between those two fixtures, Hertha away and Hertha at home? I mean, we've spent a lot of time on this show discussing uh, how Dortmund improved basically with the two signings of Jan and Haaland, uh, fixing a lot of issues that were quite pertinent in the first half of the season. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, the record speaks for itself. They've, if, if my math's not off, they've won 11 and dropped the two you mentioned in the, in the second half of the season. Um, that's really good. Obviously, they also, uh, once again went out of the cup against Werder Bremen, uh, which in this season is a real shame. I mean, last season, uh, maybe, you know, that was a different Werder side, but this team is about to get possibly relegated. So, that's not something you want on your record. And also the, the second leg against uh, PSG, not necessarily hugely confidence building per se <laughs> in, in, in Lucien Favre, but maybe there were also some mitigating circumstances there, obviously with it being the first so-called ghost game for Dortmund. 
I think for me, nothing really has changed in, in how I view Favre. I think he's a really good coach. I'm not sure he's necessarily the right fit for what Dortmund are looking for or should be looking for, in my opinion. Uh, but I also don't see necessarily how you could improve on him. Um, you know, so the 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 sort of Damocles, if you like, uh, is uh, Favre's contract situation. Obviously, I spoke about this two weeks ago or three weeks ago, whatever, uh, that, that he's obviously going into a contract year next season if indeed he's going to coach this team and Dortmund usually don't like that. And he's, you know, said to be quite flimsy about this stuff. So I don't think necessarily he's done enough to earn a uh, another contract extension, even a short-term one. So I'd still put some thought into uh, Dortmund having a coaching change, but I don't really see who could come in outside of Mauricio Pochettino, which is just not happening, uh, who could really do a much better job than than what Favre is doing. I think we need to look more at what the ambitions are, maybe, you know, I mean, Bayern, the, the, the Bayern team that uh, is, is on the pitch right now is basically unbeatable for any other German side. And so you, you kind of have to adjust your ambitions and, and Dortmund, I would say, have a pretty good shot given that they play Düsseldorf, Mainz, Leipzig and uh, Hoffenheim to end the Rückrunde, the second half of the season with, I don't know, 14 wins and two losses and maybe a draw against Leipzig or whatever. So that's uh, that's not too far off from uh, a second half of the season under Jürgen Klopp when they won the championship in which they uh, scored 15 wins and two draws. So... I mean, Dortmund can't do much better than they are doing in the second half of the season right now. And I think some of these, or some of the the, the resume uh, taking, as you put it, is, is probably down too much to the, the singular incident of not beating Bayern, which, you know, is a, is a task that I think at this point, pretty much every team in the world would struggle with. Yeah, I, I think you're right there, um, Lars. Um, I won't let you get off the hook, though, because uh, if I remember correctly, you of us three are the one that owns a Julian Brandt shirt. So uh, I think it's it's also your turn to explain what's what's going wrong here, uh, because uh, once again, he was subbed off in the 68th minute. Um, he did get the assist for Emre Can, but otherwise... Um, not the performance level uh, one would hope for for a guy with the skill level of Julian Brandt. Maybe I'm a bit uh, too harsh on him, given that he's played up front. Um, but uh, what's the issue, or is that the issue for you? No, I think the, he didn't play well. He hasn't played well in the last few games. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily make too much of him of his being substituted four games in a row. I think that's mainly down to far for liking to switch things up in the position Brandt uh, is playing at this point. Um, and also with the, the personnel available to far for, I mean, you're not going to uh, bring on, you know, uh, Marco Rente, who was on the bench, who I'm pretty sure 99% of our listeners don't know who that is. <laughs> or, or, or Chris Führich, who um, it might be 98% because he played uh, some summer prep games with them. But I mean, non notwithstanding, I would say that Brandt hasn't, used, hasn't really played up to his potential, which we've seen uh, after the restart, for example, in, in the Revier Derby and, and, and in glimpses here and there. And I think that's, that's basically who he is at this point. He's, if he were consistent all the time, uh, he wouldn't play for Dortmund. Basically, I mean, his highs are too good to play for not even the best team in Germany. Um, that might sound harsh for Dortmund fans, but it's basically a reality. If he were able to play at even 99% of his capacity all the time, he would probably be playing for Barcelona or Real Madrid right now. Because he's when he's on his game, uh, he I would argue he's world class. But, you know, when he's not on his game, he's probably among the weaker points in Dortmund's attacking machine, if you like. So right now he's the, the pendulum is swinging in the wrong direction, but with Julian Brandt and his creative genius, the, the good thing is uh, that can change in, in a heartbeat and he can have, like in the first game against Düsseldorf, for example, I think like three hockey assists or whatever they are called. 
Yeah, I assume uh, he will have a good game against Düsseldorf, uh, just because of the empirical evidence that you just <laughs> mentioned of him just playing well against Düsseldorf, I think. Uh, usually, um, Matthias, is there any anything else that we need to say about this game? Things that uh, didn't go well or did go particularly well that you observed? No, not really. I mean, um, I think we've discussed it. It's a 1-0, a uh, professional 1-0, and uh, both sides played well. Dortmund played a little bit better, so I think that pretty much sums it up. Yeah, I would say this, um, even though it was just 1-0 and was not a, you know, a festival of uh, chance creation, I think Dortmund played some really sexy football at times, and the two chances that Jaden Sancho squandered were really well crafted, um, especially against the Hertha side that defended so well and was really good, uh, really well organized. Um, you really had to craft these chances. So um, yeah, it was a bit of a shame, especially the the uh, second chance that Sancho had, where he just I I, I think he he uh, hit Jarstein uh, right on the on the goal mouth, basically. Uh, yeah, but. Uh, I think the combination football we see from Dortmund, even if it's a quote-unquote dull game, which I don't think it, it was really, um, then uh, you, you you still get some eye candy. So, uh, yeah, that's that's very positive. And uh, obviously, um, I'm looking forward to seeing Arling Haaland back in, in the lineup. And uh, I wonder uh, if Haaland goes back into the lineup, who Favre will drop last. Uh, I'm not expecting Haaland in the starting lineup necessarily, okay. but uh, I would assume uh, Witzel or Delaney. Uh, I think uh, John is going to stay in the back line with probably Piszczek getting a break. Uh, it's another English week, if I'm not mistaken, playing Mainz on Tuesday or Wednesday. And, uh, you know, so that would probably be, for me, Brandt moving a bit backwards uh, in his preferred position and then Haaland taking up one of the attacking positions. But as I said, I don't think uh, Haaland is necessarily going to start. Yeah, fair enough, uh, Matthias. This is uh, obviously going to be a very crucial game for the relegation fight. Uh, Düsseldorf right now, right now are in 16th place. They are three points above Werder Bremen. And uh, I think Werder Bremen at the same time play away to Paderborn. So um, that could mean that Bremen potentially could uh, wrestle back um, the uh, relegation playoff spot. And uh, I think the, the goal difference between Düsseldorf and Bremen is six. So uh, if Dortmund were to shellac uh, Fortuna, then, uh, you know, they, they obviously would make a big impact. So... Um, is 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 this something that uh, you observe closely during the game? How uh, the results on the other pitches go? I don't think you can during the match. Um, as far I mean, as you personally, <laughs> me personally, um, I mean sometimes I I you know with Dortmund right now less so. Uh, as a Poison Münster guy, definitely, <laughs> because they're in a relegation battle in the Dritte Liga. But, um, you know, I think even with Fortuna Düsseldorf, it's, I just think they're just that little bit ahead of Bremen that, you know, they're more looking to get, get out of the position they're in rather than worrying about Bremen catching up with them at this point. And that's kind of how I would see it too. Um, it's not really something I look at, um, at this point, we're still maybe on the last match day, but uh, not when you still have four to play. Yeah, may maybe. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I would also ask you, Lars, uh, if, if you've observed either team, uh, who do you think will have better chances to stay up, whether it be Bremen or Düsseldorf? Well, the funny thing is, if Düsseldorf were able to hold on to a lead for a change, they would probably be out of all this mess already. Uh, I think in the now 11 games under Uwe Rösler, they've been in the lead uh, eight or nine times, but they've only converted two of those into wins. One of those came against Schalke, obviously, because everybody beats Schalke these days. Even Bremen. <laughs> yeah, even Bremen. Um, I mean, they, they've, they've squandered a three-goal lead against Hertha uh, before the uh, Corona break. They were up 
and a man up against uh, no they weren't they they weren't uh, up against Hoffenheim on the last match day but before then they had a two goal lead against Cologne for example dropped that in the final minutes of the game so honestly the if if we were looking at the the football without the results if you like under Rösler you wouldn't necessarily think of them as a relegation candidate as opposed to Bremen who outside of the 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 English Woche where they had seven points from three matches including the win over Schalke and I think a goalless draw against Gladbach which is still still a pretty good result uh, I mean outside of those games they haven't really looked competitive and uh, on Sunday they dropped points against Wolfsburg pretty late in the game um, you already mentioned they play Paderborn this week, but uh, on Wednesday, I suppose, uh, Tuesday, I they think. are Tuesday or Wednesday, whatever, they are uh, playing Bayern, which, you know, <laughs> ha hasn't really gone Bremen's way over the last few years. I think they've kind of taken up Hamburg spots as, you know, the team that Bayern really like to better. And I don't know if uh, Bremen can borrow some barbecue and uh, stuff from Hamburg, but they, they might need it. Um, but then again, also Düsseldorf play against Leipzig. So uh, I think this is probably going to come down to the wire. Uh, having watched a bit of Düsseldorf, you, as I said, you wouldn't really assume they are relegation candidates, but outside of the Bayern game, which was kind of like a mulligan for them. But, but as I said, they now play Dortmund and Leipzig I think in a row. So, and it's too late to take two more mulligans. So, I don't see necessarily them getting the points they need there. So, we are presumably looking at them being level on points if Bremen can beat Paderborn uh, with two match days to go. So, you know, everything's on the table then. Yeah, Bremen also still play against Mainz, who are just three points above Düsseldorf. So, uh, at, at least in the relegation battle, I think we have a lot of uh, fun, maybe. I mean, Augsburg and, and Union Berlin also only just one point ahead of Mainz. So uh, either of the top 13 still may somehow land on, on P16. So, um, yeah, it's 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 going to be uh, very fun. And uh, it's, it's, it's kind of nice as a Dortmund fan, you really never have to worry about this since uh, 2000, what was it, 7, 6, something like that, 2005 even, I don't know, uh, when when Dortmund lost 1-0 in Bielefeld, uh, it's, it's, it's been some time since, I think that was 2007, uh, if I'm not mistaken, so uh, yeah, right right now Dortmund are definitely in, in different spheres, and uh, what I obviously forgot to mention is that on this match day, pretty much... Uh, Everything went well for Dortmund, apart from uh, Bayern beating again, uh, Leverkusen, but uh, that also means that Leipzig, Gladbach and, and Leverkusen all dropped points. Uh, Gladbach lost uh, against Freiburg, this is apparently their boogie team. Uh, Leipzig got a one all draw against Paderborn, which uh, uh, yeah was sort of just they had a one lead and then got sloppy and Paderborn was really battling hard for it and uh, forced the equalizer. And Leipzig, yeah, just didn't come back. So um, Dortmund can, I think, if uh, either Gladbach or Leverkusen lose this weekend, wrap up the uh, Champions League qualification with three points. Matthias, uh, given that Gladbach are playing Bayern, uh, I think that's that's uh, very realistic, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, Gladbach, they, they've looked good in some matches and then not so good in some matches. It, and I just think Bayern are way, way better than Gladbach. Um, I, I don't really think it's even that close at this point. So that the the only club, if I was Dortmund, that I would be seriously concerned with catching me is Leipzig. Um, but even there, there's enough of a cushion uh, that uh, as long as Dortmund doesn't screw up in the match against Leipzig, I think second place is... All I'm not going to say guaranteed, but it's looking pretty solid at this point. Yeah, I mean, uh, th there is a nice four-point gap now to Leipzig. They have 59 points. Dortmund are sitting on 63. So, um, I mean, they still play each other, but as I, th I think you're right. Uh, it doesn't really look like there are too many games that Dortmund screw up. Uh, that being said, they play against Hoffenheim on the final match day, and we've all been scarred uh, from that 2013 game. Uh, so... 
<laughs> I'm not going to make any predictions there. But uh, yeah, it, it's it's looking rather well for Dortmund. Um, Lars, uh, who of the uh, Düsseldorf squad uh, are, are the danger men and uh, who, who do you rate? Uh, the the danger man is uh, what's his face? Ruven Hennings. Yes, um, that face. I mean, he he was on like eleven goals for a couple of months, the Corona break notwithstanding. Uh, so he he had a bit of a larder hammer, as we would say in Germany. So he was looking for that goal, but it came. I don't know if it's, it, if it was last week against uh, Hoffenheim or the week before, but uh, he's back in the goals, if you like. And, you know, he's not necessarily a great striker or anything. He's a bit like uh, Florian Niederlechner of Augsburg. Uh, if people remember back to our episode ahead of the first game of the second half of the season, basically the same thing, you know, a try-hard German striker, pretty good shot, possibly overscoring his abilities this season and with Niederlechner we've also seen him or his goals dry up so it's a bit of the same but I mean he has a wicked left foot I think um, people may remember him from playing in English lower leagues if I'm not mistaken too so you know he's pretty good but I think uh, the the players that I am more looking at I, I really like Khan Ayhan the centre back uh, he has a Schalke pass but still he's a good player he uh, at times takes free kicks, which I always think is fun when a when a centre back takes free kicks, and it's not the the Naldo Thundershot department. He's actually got quite the technique in his foot. Um, I also like Kevin Stöger, the central midfielder. Uh, he's out of contract actually in July, and I'm pretty sure he's going to get a de pretty decent club. Uh, I if, if I were Leverkusen, for example, and I needed depth for Demir Bay, for example, or Amiri, if he weren't a right wing back under Peter Bosch at the moment, uh, I'd probably look at adding Stöger or, you know, a Gladbach side if I'm in Europe next season, which obviously looks very likely. Um, he might also go to Italy. There were some rumors with uh, Roma back uh, last season. He, on, on the final match day of last season, Stöger actually tore his ACL, which kind of screwed him up a bit. And he's, he, it took him a while to get back on, on, on his level. But right now he's again pulling the strings for Düsseldorf and, uh, one more player to mention uh, is Eric Tommy. Um, he's been around with Stuttgart, for example. He was he is on loan actually at Düsseldorf. Uh, very quick, uh, mostly on the left wing. Um, he scored a few goals, especially under Uwe Rösler, uh, who took over from Friedhelm Funkel in what was it February. Uh, so yeah, I mean. As I said before, this Düsseldorf team, if you if you watch them, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be the same on, on Saturday, unless they once again take a mulligan, as I said before. Uh, watching the team play and, and you know, the defensive organization and, and what they do going forward, it's not necessarily, you know, Europa League stuff or anything, but you wouldn't uh, think of them as one of the three or four worst teams in Germany. And I think outside of the results, they definitely aren't. I mean, I'd, I'd much rather watch Düsseldorf than, say, Wolfsburg, who are in 6th, or obviously Schalke in 10th, or even Hertha uh, before Labadia took over, who are, I think, in ninth. That is, I think, correct. Yeah, e Eric Tommy has scored 6 goals this season, so has Kenan Karaman. And uh, I actually uh, was quite astounded that uh, Ruven Hennings is uh, on, on 14 goals already, uh, I think, uh, for Düsseldorf striker. Um, who is not that uh, glamorous, let's say, as you call them, the dry-eyed German striker. Uh, I think that's pretty impressive. Um, Matthias, uh, do you think, though, that this is going to be a game a bit like the Paderborn match where uh, Dortmund struggle for, I don't know, 40 minutes or so, and then uh, in the second half just turn the screw to the extent that uh, Düsseldorf just fall apart? Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I watched them against Bayern, and it didn't take by on 40 minutes, uh, but in the, initially it was a little uncomfortable, but then eventually, you know, the the quality just, just won out. And it, I don't know if I could accuse Dusseldorf of giving up, but it, it seemed a little bit like, oh, well, we tried. Um, <laughs> it's Bayern. And I think uh, that could definitely happen against Dortmund because Dortmund's quality is significantly better. Um, and uh, Dusseldorf are... 
you know, they're less difficult to break down defensively than they were under Friedhelm Funkel because Uwe Rösler likes to play a little bit more adventurous. Uh, they press a little bit higher up, so they'll try to disrupt Dortmund's build-up play, much like Paderborn. Even though Düsseldorf is better than Paderborn, Uwe Rösler is a better manager than Steffen Baumgart. Uh, that being said, I mean, I don't, I don't think Dortmund are going to score six goals uh, or even five goals, but uh, three or four is is a definite possibility. Yeah, especially um, I don't think it's going to be a, a game similar to the two one loss that Dortmund took on the road to in Düsseldorf last season, just because uh, there is no Luke Bakio around and uh, Uwe Hennings is a lot of things, but he's not a pace merchant. So um, I don't think that Dortmund will be caught on the break necessarily. And even if they do, uh, I feel like they have enough in the tank to come back from, from behind if, if need be. Um, so I, I think last time Dortmund uh, nearly pulled off a comeback. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It, was, it, it, it looked for a second that Dortmund would come back into this. But uh, I think it was just an Alcasa header. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued to, to see when... Um, Arling Haaland will come on, uh, whether he starts or, uh, I don't know, will be brought on after 50 uh, minutes or so. Um, but I think the uh, the amount of substitutions really has helped Dortmund. And uh, obviously we have now seen a couple of players that we otherwise probably wouldn't have seen. Um, last week we saw Mathieu Moret yet again on the field against uh, Hertha. Um, he he looks quite decent. Uh, I don't know if it was you who said that that he is closer to the Guerrero type of player than a Hakimi. Um, but uh, what did you make of his performance against Hertha, real quick? And uh, do you expect him to to get another cameo against Fortuna? Uh, it was me, and I'm not at all surprised that he's doing well. I mean, he's obviously played like 15 minutes in his two two appearances for the first team this season, so uh, let's not put him in Canton yet, uh, <laughs> as the tuna would say. Um, That's enough I mean, for the yellow wall pot to, <laughs> to decorate him in laurels, 15 minutes, all, uh, all one needs. Um, yeah, but I mean, he is the, or oh, he seems to be the player that we saw in the summer, and I would argue that Morey was perhaps Dortmund's most impressive, certainly most impressive new player in the summer and maybe most impressive player overall. I mean, he was, he came out of nowhere, obviously, having not played for Barca because of injury for quite some time. And then after basically telling them that he'd not signed a contract, they kind of took him out of contention for starting places in their subdivision team. But, you know, <clears throat> he was uh, outstanding in the summer, quick, super uh, uh, understanding of the game. He's, as I, as I tweeted, he's basically a right-sided Guerrero in some respects. Uh, obviously, uh, I mean, he's not on Guerrero's level, at least not consistently yet. But, I mean, in terms of playing style, I mean, uh, he you could arguably, I think, put Guerrero in eight or nine positions uh, outfield positions and he would do a decent job. I don't know about center back and, and central striker, but other than that, I think Guerrero could probably play everywhere because of his understanding of the game and technical abilities. And also, uh, he's good enough athletically. And I think the same goes basically for Moray. So I'm really happy that, uh, Farfa has finally given him some game time. And, uh, if Dortmund by chance, uh, clinch the Champions League spots, uh, this weekend, I would maybe expect Moray to get like 45 minutes or even start the game against Mainz. Uh, obviously, there's always the, the 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 thing that you don't want to influence the relegation uh, battle. And if Dortmund were to lose against Mainz, resting a couple of key players, then that would be a bit of a polemic situation. So maybe that's not going to happen. But I, I'm I'm just saying I'd, I'd be excited to see more of Moray and. I think it would also behoove Dortmund to uh, test him in a competitive setting, uh, given that we all probably think Ashraf, Guerrero, uh, Ashraf Hakimi <laughs> is, not go <laughs> is not going to be uh, around next season for Dortmund. And, you know, the Thomas Meunier links have kind of dried out uh, to this point. I mean, everybody's still kind of expecting him to come to Dortmund, but I mean, unless the... 
uh, ink is dry, we, we don't know that. So Dortmund would do well to test uh, Murray in competitive setting to see if he can play at least a decent role next season. So I, I'm, I wouldn't, I'm very much hoping for that at least. Yeah, I have to issue a correction. However, Mathieu Moret has not played 15 minutes. He has played 16 minutes. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, no, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, I personally would uh, love to see him uh, maybe even start against Mainz. Uh, and uh, I don't think that Lucien Favre really is someone that really thinks about, uh, you know, being an influence in the relegation fight. I think if Dortmund have wrapped up the Champions League uh he will experiment a little bit, but uh, then again, it's Favre, the enigma. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, but uh, it's 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 good to see little uh, sparks and glimpses. But obviously, uh, you know, playing good for 15 minutes in w over two games is one thing, uh, and and playing really well over a whole season, and in a you know team with a lot of ambition is is another thing. But uh, at, at least. For now, the, the baseline looks very uh, healthy, um, Matthias. I, I think, um, I don't I don't know about you, but I, I think if I had the choice between two Guerreros and two Hakimis, I would choose two Guerreros. So um, I'm I'm happy about the the development, at least from the uh, small sample size that we saw so far. Yeah, I'll definitely agree with you there. I mean, Gotta love Hakimi, but uh, you know, defensively, I see him as a greater liability than Guerrero, even though Guerrero is not the greatest defender. Let's be honest. Um, but there's more to Guerrero's game than just pace and running really, really, really fast. Um, I think the his his understanding of footballing IQ is a little bit higher, but he's also a little bit older, so a little bit more experience there. But I will agree with you: two Guerreros beats two Hakimis. Yeah, now, uh, before we uh, move on to predictions, last real quick, um, the uh, news broke by Dortmund, was it yesterday or, or, or Monday? I don't remember, but uh, they, they had a little blurb that said that Marco Reus is back in team training. I think I, I looked it up. Uh, it took him 126 days to return to team training, and uh, as they put it, it was a very easygoing training session and uh, I think Lucien Favre sort of said that he you know is participating in, in, in parts but uh, do you think after such a long period being out uh, that we would see him other than like a glory sub in, in the final game against Hoffenheim uh, you know play play uh, for Dortmund and, and actually having the, an impact I mean I don't really understand how it would be a glory sub in a ghost game i mean who are you presenting Royce to in that <laughs> circumstance yeah, you're, you're right i'm stupid uh, and and other than that i think i didn't watch the press conference on thursday because watching far for press conferences unless it's for work purposes is basically a pointless exercise uh, but i i read somewhere that he said that they are basically um building Royce up to be a full participant in time for next season's prep instead of, you know, the one of these last four games. I mean, he has basically two and a half weeks of team training tops before the final match day. So that seems to me a bit short. And I mean, we, we, we all presume that Dortmund have, are going to have little to play for, if nothing to play for uh, on the final match day. So there's no... No need to uh, risk anything with Royce, and if if there's going to be a glory substitution or whatever, or maybe uh, you know, uh, a, a nod to someone that surely is going to go to Mario uh, Mario Götze, uh, given that he is going to say farewell to well, no one uh, in the Hoffenheim game. Yeah, uh, that's that's uh, really sad. Um, but yeah, I, basically, I just just. Uh, wanted to squeeze in the, the Royce bit just as a preemptive thing and in case people are getting their hopes up to, to see Marco Royce back on the field because I personally also really, really doubt it. Um, obviously, I'm not uh, there, a uh, team doctor, and, and see how, how far he has progressed. But uh, yeah, I, I really don't see it. So, Matthias, uh, if uh, un unless you want to say anything else about the uh, game that we will uh, play against Düsseldorf, uh, you can go ahead and leave your prediction. Well, my prediction will be a 3-0 victory for Borussia Dortmund. Very well. I'm going to go with a 4-1. Lars, are you going to go higher or lower? Lower. 3-1 Dortmund. 
All right, very well. Then uh, Lars, you can also go first and tell people how to get in touch with you. Well, first of all, if I may, uh, a little sidebar, uh, Dortmund have put out a survey on uh, the possibility or the fans' viewpoints on adding a women's team, uh, which I am a supporter of that idea. I, I'm pretty sure you are too, Stefan. I don't know Matthias's viewpoint on the, the issue, but... Uh, if you look on Twitter, basically everybody has shared it. It's in German, but you know some of our listeners certainly understand German well enough to to put in their two cents. So I would call on them to give out their opinion on the matter. I think it it's it's kind of a shame that Dortmund have to have a survey out and not just do it. But you know it's it, it's a good step in the right direction, I would say, and and I I would appreciate very much if people let it be known that Dortmund should have a women's team uh, and. If you want to discuss that or anything else with me, I am uh, on Twitter at Lars Polman. Yeah, Matthias, uh, uh, Lars is absolutely right here. Uh, I should have completely and totally brought up the the potential women's team. Uh, since I don't know your thoughts, what are your thoughts? <laughs> oh, I'm all for it. I honestly, until it, it's kind of one of those. How does Dortmund not have one? Um, and I agree with Lars that I don't understand why you need to do a survey. It's like, oh, really? Just do it. I mean, seriously. Come on. Um, so, yeah, go go uh, follow Lars and Stefan and myself. You can find me at Matthias Huck. And uh, put in your opinion on the survey and make sure Borussia don't want to have a women's team. Yeah, definitely. I I think right now they're sort of asking themselves and 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 fans how they would sort of like it if they just purchase a license of a different club, a bit uh, the same method that uh, Leipzig used to get into the first division. Um, maybe uh, they are looking at uh, uh, the women's team of Berghofen, which is a Dortmund side that plays in the third division. That could be something that they sort of want to know offense. But yeah, it's it's kind of weird. Like the sixth question in the survey asks, did you know that uh, Dortmund are the only team of the top 17 in the UFR ranking that does not have a women's team? So uh, yeah, it's <laughs> it's a bit weird the survey, but uh, yeah, please everyone go there. Uh, I'll link it in the show notes as well and uh, make sure that uh, Dortmund get the women's team because I think it's it's absolutely necessary. And uh, Alexandra Pop, who is obviously a famous uh, German uh, football player, she's also a Dortmund fan. She's born in the same village or town uh, where I was born, which is Witten. It's about twenty kilometers. Uh, of Dortmund, uh, she said that she would uh, love to, you know, maybe enter a career or so for Dortmund. But if this needs to happen, I think she's 29 years old. Dortmund need to get going because, uh, you know, I think the uh, to to get a women's team in the Bundesliga, you probably need four to five seasons or so. So uh, Dortmund should hurry a little bit. But uh, yeah, it's important that they come up with a long-term concept and uh, some some way or form to establish it. But uh, yeah. I, I think it's it's very important uh, for women's football and obviously ideally uh, at some point we will see the Westfalen Stadion sold out in a tie against uh, Bayern or so from in in women's soccer uh, that would be an absolute dream because uh, I I personally like to watch it as well and uh, I also think it really helps in terms of equality because uh, women are and especially female athletes are in, in general, way more outspoken than than men. Uh, it's it's kind of uh, reaffirming right now that a lot of uh, male athletes are speaking out about the uh, political and and uh, you know societal uh, causes. But uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, I I appreciate it. So if Dortmund add a, a women's team, I I think there's really not one reason I can think of not to do it. So please uh, go take the survey and. Uh, you can find me at Stefan Busco on Twitter and all of us at Yellow Wallpot on Facebook and Twitter as well. And if you want to read our written content, go to theyellowwall.net where you can also find all the ways and means to subscribe to this podcast, which is YouTube, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, and so on and so forth. Spotify, I should mention as well. And uh, yeah, if you want to contribute financially or sponsor an episode, go to patreon.com slash theyellowwall. And that's enough for now. Until next week, as always, thank you for listening. Goodbye.